This video presents examination of the neck vessels, including the carotid arteries and jugular veins, and examination of the heart using inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. Before examining the neck vessels, elevate the head of the bed or examination table to about 30 degrees and ask the patient to lie down. To assess the carotid arteries, first inspect the neck for pulsations. To feel the carotid artery, place your left thumb or your right index and middle fingers on the right carotid artery just inside the sternomastoid muscle. Palpate in the lower half of the neck to avoid pressing on the carotid sinus. As you feel the pulse, concentrate on its amplitude and contour. Note any variation in amplitude from beat to beat or with respiration. With your right thumb, palpate the left carotid pulse in the same manner, comparing it with the other side. Do not press on both carotid arteries at once. Next, use the bell of the stethoscope to auscultate for a bruy on both sides of the neck. A bruy is a whooshing, murmur-like sound that suggests arterial narrowing. If present, it would sound like this. Now, examine the jugular veins. Have the patient turn his head away from you slightly. Then, using tangential lighting, inspect the jugular veins on the right side. Usually, the best vein for analysis is the right internal jugular. First, identify the external jugular vein. If it's not visible, compression just above the clavicle may distend it. Then, find the pulsations of the internal jugular vein. Here, they are seen between the two attachments of the sternomastoid muscle. To estimate jugular venous pressure, and the pressure in the right atrium, first identify the highest point of pulsation in the internal jugular vein. Next, find the sternal angle. Then measure the vertical distance between that point and the sternal angle in centimeters. The number of centimeters is an estimate of jugular venous pressure. When recording this estimate, also document the angle at which the bed is elevated. In this patient, the internal jugular venous pressure is one centimeter above the sternal angle, with the head of the bed elevated 30 degrees. In another patient, the pulsations of the internal jugular vein are easy to see, especially during expiration. Note their soft, rapid, undulating quality with two elevations and two troughs per heartbeat. Compare them to the single thrust of the carotid artery pulsations. To examine the heart, stand at the patient's right side. Have the patient remain supine with the upper body raised to about 30 degrees. Inspect the precordium, noting any pulsations, heaves, or retractions. There are none here. Look for the apical impulse, which, when visible, is normally seen in the left fifth interspace at or medial to the midclavicular line. Using your fingertips, palpate for pulsations or heart sounds in the right second interspace, left second interspace, and left third interspace. Next, palpate for the systolic impulse of the right ventricle. While keeping one finger in the third interspace, place additional fingertips in the fourth and fifth interspaces. If an impulse is palpable, note its location, duration, and amplitude. 
If the patient's chest has an increased anteroposterior diameter, palpate for the right ventricular impulse high in the epigastric area where it may be easier to feel. Finally, palpate the apical impulse. If it is not visible, feel for its location with your palm and fingers. When you find it, assess it with your fingertips. Observe its location, diameter, amplitude, and duration. Identify its location by the interspaces in which you feel the apical impulse and by its distance in centimeters from the mid-sternal or mid-clavicular line. Measure the diameter of the impulse in centimeters. Feel for the amplitude of the apical impulse. It is usually small and feels like a gentle tap. To estimate the duration of the apical impulse, feel it as you listen to the heart sounds with a stethoscope. The normal impulse may last through the first two-thirds of systole, but not longer. Please turn over to your left side. If you can't feel the apical impulse, ask the patient to roll partly onto his left side and try again. Now I'd like to tap on your chest to see the size of your heart. If you still can't feel the apical impulse, estimate heart size by percussion. Starting on the far left of the chest, percuss toward the left border of cardiac dullness in the third, fourth, fifth, and possibly sixth interspaces. Normally, percussion reveals pulmonary resonance laterally and cardiac dullness medially. Before auscultating the heart, let's review normal heart sounds. Closure of the heart valves creates a pair of audible heart sounds. The first sound, S1, accompanies mitral valve closure. The second sound, S2, accompanies aortic valve closure. Pulmonic and tricuspid valve closure may contribute to these sounds. Ventricular systole occurs between S1 and S2. Ventricular diastole occurs between S2 and the next S1. Because diastole usually lasts longer than systole, you can identify the two sounds. One, two, one, two, one, two. You can hear S1 and S2 in the aortic area, in the right second interspace close to the sternum, pulmonic area in the left second interspace close to the sternum, left third interspace, tricuspid area in the left fourth and fifth interspaces, and mitral area at the apical impulse. The aortic and pulmonic areas together are sometimes called the base of the heart. For auscultation of the heart, you may choose between two sequences. In the first, start with the diaphragm of the stethoscope and progress from the right second interspace to the left second interspace and down the left sternal border to the apex. Then, with the bell of the stethoscope, listen again at the mitral and tricuspid areas. Starting in the right second interspace helps orient you to the cardiac cycle. In the second sequence, start with the bell and listen first at the mitral and tricuspid areas. Then change to the diaphragm and, starting in the aortic area, listen to all five areas from above down. Starting at the mitral area is useful when you've had to turn the patient to find the apical impulse. The first auscultation sequence is shown in this video. What I'm going to do now is listen to your heart in the various areas of your chest. Now adjust your stethoscope so that you'll be listening through the diaphragm. When pressed firmly on the chest, the diaphragm is best for hearing relatively high-pitched sounds, such as S1, S2, 
the murmurs of aortic and mitral regurgitation, and pericardial friction rubs. Begin listening at the right second interspace close to the sternum. Note the cardiac rate and rhythm. Identify the first and second heart sounds and listen for extra heart sounds and murmurs. Please breathe deeper than normal. Then listen at the left second interspace. Try to hear splitting of S2. Here it is abnormally wide. It comes and goes with respiration. Continue to breathe deep. Proceed along the left sternal border to the third interspace. Again, listen for splitting of S2. Continue to the fourth interspace. And then to the fifth interspace. Finally, listen at the apex. Now switch to the bell of the stethoscope, which is more sensitive to low-pitched sounds, such as S3, S4, and the murmur of mitral stenosis. Listen at the apex again. In the fifth interspace, and in the fourth interspace, Now that you've seen the listening areas in sequence, focus on the heart sounds in each area. S2 is usually louder than S1 in the aortic area. Please breathe deeper than normal. S2 is usually louder in the pulmonic area also. Note the late inspiratory splitting of S2. Its first component, A2, is aortic. Its second component, P2, comes from pulmonic valve closure. In the left third interspace, both A2 and P2 may be heard again. S2 usually diminishes in intensity as you proceed down the left sternal border. Meanwhile, S1 usually gets a little louder. In the tricuspid area, S1 may sound split. Its softer second component comes from closure of the tricuspid valve. Here at the mitral area, S1 is usually louder than S2. It comes from closure of the mitral valve. To improve your ability to hear S3, S4, and the murmur of mitral stenosis, have the patient roll partway onto his left side, which brings the left ventricle closer to the chest wall. Then recheck the position of the apical impulse and place the bell lightly on it. If the patient had an audible S3, it would sound like this. Now notice how the third heart sound disappears when the bell is placed more firmly on the chest wall.
Listen again with light pressure. With firm pressure. And once again with light pressure. To help detect aortic murmurs, especially that of aortic regurgitation, have the patient sit up and lean forward. Then ask him to exhale completely and hold his breath out. Using the diaphragm of the stethoscope, listen at the left second interspace Breathe. and down the left sternal border to the apex. Breathe out completely again and hold it. Pause periodically to allow the patient to breathe. Listen for the high-pitched diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation. If the patient had this murmur, it would sound like this. You may breathe. Take another deep breath. Breathe out and hold it. Heart murmurs can be distinguished from heart sounds by their longer duration. Diastolic murmurs, like this one, usually indicate heart disease. Systolic murmurs can occur in healthy people or in those with heart disease. For example, a loud mid-systolic murmur may be heard in aortic stenosis. If you hear such a loud murmur, palpate the area with the ball of your hand. Palpable vibrations associated with a heart murmur are called a thrill. In summary, examination of the neck vessels and heart includes assessment of the neck vessels, including the carotid arteries and jugular veins, and examination of the heart using inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. This video presents a brief survey of the patient's thorax and respiration Examination of the posterior thorax using inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And examination of the anterior thorax using the same techniques. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may display normal variations or abnormal findings. Begin your examination with a brief survey of the patient's chest and respiration. Observe the rate, rhythm, depth, and effort of breathing, and listen to the sound of his breathing. Normally, a resting adult breathes easily, quietly, and regularly about 14 to 20 times a minute. Inspect the patient's neck for supraclavicular retractions and for contractions of the sternomastoid muscles. Normally, they're not present. It looks normal. Cross your arms like this. Then have the patient place his arms on the opposite shoulders and breathe normally. Now examine the posterior thorax, beginning with inspection. Observe the chest for shape, symmetry, and deformities. Also inspect the overlying skin. Palpate the chest to locate any areas of pain or tenderness or to assess any lesions or abnormalities you may have found during inspection. To assess respiratory expansion, place your thumbs close to the patient's spine at the level of the 10th ribs and spread your hands lightly over the thorax. Ask the patient to inhale deeply and exhale fully while you watch the divergence of your thumbs and feel for the range and symmetry of movement. Next, using this pattern, systematically palpate for tactile fremitus. Using the balls of your hands, palpate and compare symmetrical areas for tactile fremitus 
as the patient repeats 99. 99. Identify areas of 99. increased, decreased, or absent fremitus. Continue the examination by percussing the chest in a systematic manner, going from side to side as you move down the thorax. Percuss down the chest wall from the apices to the bases of the lungs. Listen to the intensity, pitch, and duration of your percussion notes and decide what kind of notes you are hearing. Normal lungs are resonant. Locate any areas where you hear abnormal notes. Next, use percussion to identify the level of diaphragmatic dullness and measure diaphragmatic excursion. Now, if it is all right with you, I'll put some ink marks on your back. Then percuss downward from above the expected level of diaphragmatic no, dullness until dullness is definitely heard. Mark the level of full expiration. This time, breathe all the way in and hold. Next, have the patient inhale deeply and hold it in. Then percuss downward to the level of dullness at full inspiration and mark it. Can Repeat this process on the other side. Here, same thing. Breathe all the way out and hold it. Then measure the distance between the expiratory and inspiratory levels of dullness. The distance is normally five to six centimeters. Before auscultating the posterior thorax, let's review normal and adventitious breath sounds. Normal breath sounds are classified by their intensity, pitch, and duration during inspiration and expiration. Vesicular breath sounds are soft and low-pitched. They're normally heard during inspiration and the first third of expiration and can be heard throughout most of the lung fields. Bronchial breath sounds are louder and higher in pitch than vesicular sounds. The expiratory sound lasts longer than the inspiratory sound, and a silent gap separates these two sounds. Normally, bronchial breath sounds are sometimes heard over the manubrium. Bronchovesicular sounds have an intermediate pitch and intensity. Inspiratory and expiratory sounds are about equal in duration, and a silent gap may or may not separate them. These sounds may be heard in the first and second interspaces anteriorly, and between the scapulae posteriorly. Let's listen to these sounds again to compare them. Bronchial, bronchovesicular, and vesicular sounds, in that order. To examine the anterior thorax, have the patient lie supine and breathe normally. Observe the condition of the skin and inspect the chest for deformities, asymmetry, and respiratory movement. Next, palpate the chest to locate any areas of tenderness or to assess any lesions or abnormalities. No. Now assess respiratory expansion. Place your thumbs along each costal margin with your hands along the lateral rib cage. Raise loose skin folds between your thumbs and ask the patient to take a deep breath. Observe the displacement of your thumbs and feel for the range and symmetry of movement as the patient exhales fully. Next, following this pattern, palpate for tactile fremitus. As the patient repeats 99, 99, 99. use the ball of your hand to compare symmetrical areas. 99. Because fremitus is difficult to feel through the breast tissue of women, you may need to gently displace the breast. 
percuss the anterior thorax in symmetrical areas proceeding from the supraclavicular area down to the sixth rib or below. Again, compare both sides. Identify your percussion notes and their locations. You should hear resonance over the anterior lung fields. If you want to check the level of the right diaphragm anteriorly, percuss from resonant lung downward to liver dullness. To auscultate the anterior chest, take the same systematic approach you used for percussing the anterior thorax. If necessary, gently displace the patient's breasts to auscultate all important areas. Listen to the duration, pitch, and intensity of the inspiratory and expiratory sounds, decide what type of breath sounds you are hearing, and note any added sounds. If you hear heart sounds near the heart, try to ignore them while you concentrate on the breath sounds. Now let's listen as the examiner auscultates. Let's say 99 again. If you hear bronchial 99. or bronchovesicular breath sounds where they should not be, listen for transmitted 99. voice sounds. 99. To summarize, examination of the thorax and lungs includes a brief survey of the thorax and respiration, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation of the posterior and anterior thorax. This video presents examination of the motor system, which includes assessment of body position, involuntary movements, muscle bulk, muscle tone, strength, and coordination, and testing of the reflexes, which assesses both motor and sensory functions. In this video, you'll see the examiner assess a healthy patient. In clinical practice, you may detect the same normal findings in patients, or you may discover normal variations or abnormal findings. Begin the examination of the motor system by observing the patient's body position at rest and during movement. I'm gonna move these up for a minute. Also, watch for involuntary movements. Can I see your hands? Next, Assess muscle characteristics, beginning with muscle bulk. To do this, carefully inspect the muscles of the shoulders, arms, hands, thighs, and legs, noting any atrophy. Let me do all the work here. Then, evaluate the patient's muscle tone or resistance to passive stretch. Encourage the patient to relax. Then, take one hand in yours, and, while supporting the elbow, Flex and extend the patient's fingers, wrist, elbow, and shoulder in one coordinated movement. The patient's arm should move easily and smoothly with little resistance. 
Repeat on the other side. Once again, let me do all the work. To assess muscle tone in the legs, extend the patient's leg at the knee and move the foot up and down at the ankle. Note the patient's resistance to your movements. Assess muscle strength using force compatible with the patient's strength. Usually, the patient's dominant side is stronger than the non-dominant side. Begin by testing flexion and extension at the elbow by having the patient pull and push against your hand. Straighten it out, push away. Bend your fist back. Next, test extension of the wrist. Make a fist. Bend your fist back. Around my fingers. Now test Squeeze the patient's grip. You Cross your middle and index fingers to protect them. Good. Then ask the patient to squeeze as hard as possible while you try to remove your fingers. Normally, you should have trouble removing them. Continue testing muscle strength by asking the patient to turn his palm down and spread his fingers. Check abduction by trying to force them together. Relax for a second. Then test opposition of the thumb. To do this, ask the patient to try to touch the tip of his little finger with the thumb while you resist the movement. Assess muscle strength in the legs. Relax. Test hip flexion by placing your hand on the patient's anterior thigh and providing resistance. Relax. Then test hip extension by placing your hand on the patient's posterior thigh and providing resistance. Push your thigh down against my hand. To test hip abduction, place your hands firmly on the table outside the patient's knees. Ask him to spread both legs against your hands. To test hip adduction, place your hands between the patient's knees and ask him to bring his legs together. Note the strength. Try to lift your foot off the table. Continue by testing muscle strength at the knee. To assess extension, support the patient's knee in flexion and ask him to straighten his leg against your hand. Try to lift this foot off the table. Note the strength and compare it with the other side. Relax. Don't let me lift this foot off the table. To assess knee flexion, shift your hands, but leave the patient's Relax. leg flexed at the knee. Then ask the patient to keep his heel Don't on the table as you try to straighten the leg by pulling it upward. Again, note the strength and compare it with the other knee. Push Finally, down. test dorsiflexion and plantar flexion at the ankle by asking the patient to pull up and push down against your hand. All of these tests can also be performed with the patient seated and holding on to the table for support. Hip flexion, hip abduction, hip adduction, knee extension, knee flexion, Relax. Down against ankle hand. plantar flexion, Relax. and ankle dorsiflexion. Relax. To assess coordination, you'll evaluate rapid alternating movements and point-to-point -point movements. Begin by assessing rapid alternating movements. To assess the arms, show the patient how to move his hands. Observe the speed, rhythm, and smoothness of the movements. The patient's dominant hand may be better coordinated. Using your right hand, I'd like you now to Now ask the patient to tap the distal joint of his thumb with the tip of his index finger as rapidly as possible. And the other hand? Again, observe the movement's speed, rhythm, and smoothness. Touch the tip of my Next, finger with assess point-to-point right -point -point movements. Do this several times, moving your finger so that the patient has to change directions. Observe the smoothness and accuracy of pointing. Clumsiness and overshooting with this movement suggest cerebellar disease. Then, with your finger in one place, ask the patient to point to it, raise his arm, and lower it to touch your finger. After several times, have the patient do this with his eyes closed. 
Inaccurate pointing with the eyes closed suggests a loss of position sense. Repeat on the other side. I want you to, tap my to assess hand leg coordination, ask the patient to tap your hand as quickly as possible with the ball of each foot. Note any slowness or awkwardness. Compare sides. The feet normally perform less well than the hands. To test point-to-point -point movements of the legs, ask the patient to place one heel on the opposite knee and then run it down his shin to the big toe. The patient should be able to do this smoothly and accurately. Note any tremor or awkwardness. Assess both legs. Continue the examination by observing the patient's gait, which provides information about coordination, position sense, and muscle strength. Slowly across the room. Turn. As the patient walks, observe his posture, balance, arm swing, and leg movements. The gait should be relaxed and balanced with easy alternating arm swings. The face and head should lead the rest of the body on turns. Next, ask the patient to walk heel to toe in a straight line. This kind of gait, also called tandem walking, assesses cerebellar function and position sense. Then have the patient walk on his toes to test the strength of plantar flexion and on his heels to test dorsiflexion at the ankles. These actions also test balance. Next, ask the patient to hop in place, first on one leg and then the other. This ability indicates an intact motor system in the legs normal cerebellar function, and good position sense. Good. Now I want you to stand just on your Finally, right ask the patient to do a shallow knee bend, first on one leg and then on the other. Down. Perform the Romberg test, which primarily tests position sense. To do this, ask the patient to stand with his feet together. Normally, he should be able to maintain this posture with his eyes open, indicating intact cerebellar function. Now have the patient do the same thing for 20 to 30 seconds with his eyes closed. His posture should remain steady with only minimal swaying, indicating intact position sense. If the patient maintains this posture with his eyes open, but not with his eyes closed, he has a positive Romberg test. Now check for pronator drift. To do this, ask the patient to hold his arms forward and parallel with the palms up and to close his eyes for 20 to 30 seconds. Normally, the patient can maintain this position, but watch for downward drifting of one arm and pronation of the forearm, which suggest mild hemiparesis. Stay just as you are. Finally, ask the patient to keep his arms up and eyes closed while you tap the arms briskly downward. Normally, the patient's arms return smoothly to the horizontal position. Begin assessing deep tendon reflexes by testing the biceps reflex. To do this, the patient's arm must be relaxed, partially flexed at the elbow, and positioned with the palm down. To stretch the muscle, depress the biceps tendon with your thumb or index finger. Strike your thumb or finger briskly with the reflex hammer. You should feel the biceps muscle contract and see flexion of the forearm. Here you see a two plus response. Just keep your arm as relaxed as you can. To assess the triceps reflex, flex the patient's arm at the elbow with the palm toward the body and pull the arm slightly across the chest. Strike the triceps tendon above the elbow. Watch for contraction of the triceps muscle and extension at the elbow. Here you see two plus responses. To elicit the brachioradialis reflex, the patient's forearms should rest on the lap with the palms down. When the patient is ready, strike the radius one to two inches above the wrist. Observe for flexion and supination of the forearm. Again, you see two plus responses. To test the knee reflex, locate the patellar tendon in the patient's flexed knee. Briskly tap the tendon just below the patella. Feel for contraction of the quadriceps and look for extension of the knee. 
These are two plus responses. To test the ankle reflex, extend the patient's leg somewhat at the knee, dorsiflex the ankle firmly, and strike the Achilles tendon. Feel and watch for plantar flexion. These are two plus responses. Support your foot. To elicit the plantar response, stimulate the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot from the heel to the ball, curving medially across the ball. Use the lightest stimulus that will provoke a response. Note movement of the toes, normally flexion. Dorsiflexion of the big toe with fanning of the other toes is a pathological response known as the Babinski response. For a patient who cannot sit up, all of these tests can be performed with the patient lying down. Biceps reflex, triceps reflex, brachioradialis reflex, knee reflex, ankle reflex, plantar response, and ankle clonus. Dorsiflexion of the big toe with fanning of the other toes is a pathological response known as the Babinski response. Relax your ankle. If leg reflexes seem hyperactive, test for ankle clonus. To do this, move the foot up and down a few times and then sharply dorsiflex the foot. While holding the foot in dorsiflexion, look and feel for sustained rhythmic oscillations. A few beats may be normally present. Now. If leg reflexes are symmetrically diminished or absent, use reinforcement. Have the patient lock his hands and pull just as you test the reflex. To reinforce arm reflexes, ask the patient to clench his teeth. If you suspect meningeal inflammation, test for meningeal signs. With the patient lying down, place your hands behind the patient's head and flex the neck forward until the chin touches the chest if possible there should be no resistance or pain. As you flex the patient's neck, watch his hips and knees. Normally, they should remain relaxed and motionless. Hip and knee flexion with this maneuver is a positive Brzezinski's sign. Finally, flex one of the patient's legs at the hip and knee, and then straighten the knee. This action normally produces discomfort behind the knee during extension, but should not cause pain. Pain and resistance to knee extension is a positive Koenig sign. To summarize, the neurologic examination of the motor system and reflexes includes observation of body position and involuntary movements, assessment of muscle bulk, muscle tone, and strength, evaluation of coordination, and testing of deep tendon and other reflexes. This video presents examination of the abdomen, including inspection, auscultation, percussion and palpation of the abdominal wall, percussion and palpation of the liver, percussion and palpation of the spleen, and palpation of the right kidney and aorta. In the video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. Before you examine the abdomen, make sure that the patient has emptied her bladder. Ask her to lie down and relax and make her as comfortable as possible. Expose her lower chest and abdomen, but keep her genitalia covered. Inspect the skin for scars, striae, dilated veins, or rashes. 
Inspect the symmetry and contour of the abdomen and note any peristalsis, pulsations, or masses. Also observe the contour of the umbilicus and look for signs of inflammation or hernia. Listen for bowel sounds by placing the diaphragm of the stethoscope gently on the right lower quadrant. Listen to their pitch, quality, and frequency. If the patient has hypertension, listen for bruises over the right renal artery, aorta, and left renal artery. If present, a bruise would sound like this. In a patient with hypertension, a bruise raises suspicion of renal artery stenosis, but most bruises have other causes. If you suspect arterial insufficiency in the legs, listen for bruises over the aorta, right iliac artery, and left iliac artery. Then identify and listen over the right femoral artery and left femoral artery. Lightly percuss the abdomen to assess the distribution of tympani and dullness. Tympani indicates gas in the stomach or intestine. Dullness suggests fluid or feces. Note any large area of dullness that might suggest a mass or enlarged organ. Briefly percuss the lower anterior chest. On the right, liver dullness is usually present. On the left, you may hear the tympani of the gastric air bubble. Palpate the abdomen beginning gently and saving painful areas for last. With your fingers together, place your hand flat on the abdomen and press using a light dipping motion. Moving smoothly, feel in all quadrants, identifying any tenderness or increased resistance to your hand. When resistance is present, try to relax the patient and palpate gently again. Just let me know if anything's uncomfortable. Then palpate more deeply in all four quadrants as you feel for any masses or tenderness. One hand on top of the other may make it easier to feel deeply. If you feel a structure that suggests a segment of colon, roll it under your fingers in one direction, then another, and try to assess its shape. Here the sigmoid colon is palpable. Abdominal pain, tenderness, and involuntary muscular rigidity suggests peritoneal irritation. <coughs> to localize it, ask the patient to cough and then show you where it hurts. Then try to localize the tenderness with one finger. Right there. If necessary, feel for rebound tenderness. Now I'm going to push down here and I'm going to let go very quickly. And I want you to tell me whether it hurts more when I push down or when I let go. Okay. Press your fingers in firmly and slowly, then quickly withdraw them. Watch and listen for signs of pain. It hurts more when you push down. Unlike in this patient, pain induced or worsened by withdrawal is rebound tenderness and suggests peritoneal inflammation. Percuss the span of liver dullness in the right midclavicular line. From an area of tympani well below the expected liver, percuss up to the lower border of liver dullness. Mark this spot. Mark here. Then percuss from lung resonance down the midclavicular line to the upper border of liver dullness. Mark this spot too. Measure the span of liver dullness between your two marks. 
Here it is about seven centimeters. That's about seven centimeters. To palpate the liver, place your left hand behind the chest margin and your right hand lateral to the rectus abdominis muscles and well below the lower border of liver dullness. Again. Press gently into the abdomen and as the patient breathes deeply, try to feel for the liver edge as it moves down. If possible, let the liver slip under your finger pads as you feel its surface. Let's try there again. Once more. Let it out. Take a real deep breath. You often need to try again using different pressures and moving your fingertips closer to the costal margin. Once again, please. The hooking technique may also be helpful. Standing to the right of the patient's chest, place the fingers of both hands below the border of liver dullness and press in and up toward the costal margin. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. Deeper one more time. All right, out. This liver is not palpable. All right, that's fine. To, to assess for tenderness, tenderness when the liver is not palpable, place your left hand flat on the right lower rib cage and gently strike it with the ulnar surface of your right fist. Ask the patient to compare the sensation with a similar strike on the other side. To assess the size of the spleen, percuss the left lower anterior chest wall in a lateral direction, noting the extent of tympany. If tympany is prominent laterally, spleen enlargement is unlikely. Next, check for a splenic percussion sign. Find the lowest interspace in the left anterior axillary line and percuss there. If tympany is heard, ask the patient to take a deep breath. All right, now let it out. As you continue to percuss in the same place. When spleen size is normal, tympany usually persists and the sign is considered negative. An enlarged spleen is then very unlikely. When the spleen is enlarged, tympany often changes to dullness. This is a positive sign. This sign may be falsely positive, but it indicates careful palpation. All right, I'm going to see now if I can feel the spleen. Next, palpate the spleen. With your left hand, reach over and around the patient to support the left lower posterior rib cage and adjacent tissue. Place your right hand on the abdomen, low enough to detect a large spleen, and point your fingers toward the costal margin. When the patient takes a deep breath, try to feel the spleen as it comes down to meet your fingertips. Repeat several times varying your hand position and moving it up gradually toward the costal margin. Now could you roll onto then your ask the patient right to turn onto her right side and try again. The spleen is not usually palpable. Get the drape where we need it. If you feel it, measure its distance in centimeters from the costal margin during inspiration. Take a deep breath. Out. Again. To assess the aorta, press firmly into the upper abdomen, slightly left of midline, and feel for its pulsations. In patients over 50, try to assess the width of the aorta. Pressing deeply with a hand on each side of it, try to estimate its width, and it's normally 2.5 centimeters or less. We're just about finished. Could you sit up, please? Finally, assess for kidney tenderness when the patient sits up. Place the ball of your left hand on each costovertebral angle in turn and strike it with the ulnar surface of your fist. Normal kidneys are not tender. In summary, examination of the abdomen involves inspection, auscultation, percussion and palpation of the abdominal wall, percussion and palpation of the liver, percussion and palpation of the spleen, and palpation of the right kidney and aorta.
This video presents examination of the peripheral vascular system, including the arteries, veins, and lymph nodes in the arms and legs. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. System. Begin by inspecting both arms from the fingertips to the shoulders. And turn them over. Note areas of edema, discoloration, rashes, scars, and changes in skin texture. None are seen here. Also note hair distribution and venous patterns. Assess the skin temperature of the hands and lower arms with the sensitive backs of your fingers, comparing both sides. If you detect unusual coolness or temperature differences, check further up the arms. Next, palpate the radial pulses and compare their amplitudes. If you suspect arterial insufficiency in an arm or hand, feel for the ulnar pulse. The pulse of a normal ulnar artery may not be palpable. To help determine the patency of the ulnar artery, perform the Allen test. Place your thumbs lightly over the radial and ulnar arteries and tell the patient to clench his fist tightly. Then firmly compress both arteries between your thumbs and fingers. Open your hand. Have the patient open and relax his hand. Note the color of his palms and fingers, which should be pale. Then release the pressure over the ulnar artery. If the artery is patent, the palm should turn pink in three to five seconds. I'd like to repeat this test to check the other artery. Will you make a fist again, please? To assess the patency of the radial artery when indicated, open your hand, repeat these steps, but release the pressure over the radial artery. Next, assess the brachial pulse. Flex the patient's elbow slightly. Then, with the thumb of your opposite hand, palpate the pulse at the antecubital crease, just medial to the biceps tendon. Then, try to feel the epitrochlear node. With the patient's elbow somewhat flexed and the forearms supported by your hand, feel in the groove between the biceps and triceps muscles about three centimeters above the medial epicondyle. If the epitrochlear node is palpable, note its size, consistency, and tenderness. Repeat on the other arm. Examination of the peripheral vascular system involves assessment of the arteries, veins, and lymph nodes in the arms and legs. This video introduces general observations of neurologic status and then focuses on examination of the cranial nerves including assessment of the motor and sensory portions of cranial nerves 1 through 12, and examination of the sensory system, including assessment of pain, temperature, light touch, and vibratory sensations, as well as position sense and discriminative sensations. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Your patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. To perform the neurologic examination efficiently, combine portions of it with other parts of the assessment, such as the interview. When talking with the patient, observe the patient's mental status, speech, mood, memory, and orientation. To assess its function, first be sure both nasal passages are patent. Any problems? No. Then, with one of the patient's nostrils occluded and his eyes closed, pass a mildly aromatic and familiar substance, such as vanilla, cloves, soap, or coffee, under the open nostril. If the patient detects the smell, ask him to identify it. Repeat this test on the other side. Cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve, mediates vision. I'd like to test your vision now. If you could hold to assess its function, 
Check the patient's visual acuity and visual fields and inspect the optic fundi. Can you read the numbers on that? If a Snellen chart is not available, Nine, test visual acuity three, by using a special handheld seven, eye card. Eight, to do this, ask the patient two, to cover one eye, hold the card about 14 inches away from his eyes, and read aloud the smallest print possible. Four, if the patient requires reading or general purpose glasses or contact lenses, he should wear them. Can you cover up the other then eye? Then test the other eye. Thank you. For screening purposes, visual fields are tested by confrontation. Face the patient directly and imagine a glass bowl encircling the head. Ask the patient to look with both eyes into your eyes. Then place your hands about two feet apart, lateral to the patient's ears. Then slowly move the wiggling fingers of both hands along the imaginary bowl until the patient identifies them. Repeat this action in the upper and lower temporal quadrants. Normally, a person sees both sets of fingers at the same time. I'd like you to cover up your left eye. If you think you've found a visual field like defect, such as loss of vision in the right temporal field, slowly move your wiggling fingers from the defective area of the field toward the better vision. Repeat this at several levels until you can define the border of the defect. These responses suggest a defect throughout the temporal half of the field. Test the other eye for an accompanying defect. Next, inspect each ocular fundus by using an ophthalmoscope. Assess the optic nerve by inspecting the optic disc. Note its color, the sharpness of the margins, and the width of the physiologic cup. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves, control eye movements. Because these nerves work together so closely, they're examined as a group. The oculomotor nerve is also responsible for pupillary constriction and raising the upper eyelid. Check the position of the upper eyelids while the patient looks directly at you. The eyelids should be symmetrical and should not obscure the pupils. Next, inspect the pupils. They should be round and approximately equal in size. Size should be appropriate to room light. Test the pupillary reaction to light by shining a light on each pupil in turn. Observe for the direct reaction and the consensual reaction. If the light reaction is abnormal or ambiguous, Test the patient's near reaction. Hold your finger or a pencil about 10 centimeters from the patient's eyes and tell him what to do. Look at my finger. Look off into the distance. Watch for pupillary dilation with distant gaze and pupillary constriction with near effort. Look at my finger. Look off to the distance. Repeat this test if necessary. Look off to the distance. Now check the extraocular movements in the six cardinal directions of gaze. From two to three feet in front of the patient, ask him to look at your finger as it moves to the patient's far right, to the right and up, to the right and down. Now move your finger to the far left, to the left and up, and to the left and down. These movements should be symmetrical and conjugate. Look for the jerky movements of nystagmus in lateral gaze and in upward gaze. Test for convergence of the eyes by asking the patient to look at your finger as you move it toward the bridge of his nose. Eyes can usually follow your finger to within 5 to 8 centimeters. The sensory portion of cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, mediates facial sensation and the sensory part of the corneal reflex. The motor portion of the nerve innervates all the muscles of mastication. I'm going to test to test the nerve's the motor function, ask the patient to clench and then part. relax his jaw relax. while you palpate the temporal down muscles down and then the masseter muscles. Relax. Note the strength of muscle contraction. Relax. The sensory portion of the trigeminal nerve has three divisions, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular divisions. All three areas should be tested symmetrically by assessing the patient's sensation of pain, light touch, and perhaps temperature. I want you to close your Explain eyes. and show the patient how you will assess for pain. 
Then, with the patient's eyes closed, sharp. test for pain sensation using the sharp, sharp end of a previously unused safety pin or sharp. other suitable sharp object. Occasionally, no. substitute the dull end for the sharp one as you test sharp. scattered areas. Sharp. Sharp. Now I'm going to compare side to side. Keep your eyes closed. Is this the same as this? Then compare yes. symmetrical areas is on both sides of the face. The same as this. Yes. If you suspect an abnormality, Hot. confirm it by testing temperature sensitivity. Cold. Again, explain the test first Cold. to the patient. Then, with the patient's eyes Hot. closed, test scattered areas. If Hot. indicated, compare sides. Cold. I'm going to test the sensation of your face by lightly touching the cotton against your skin. When you feel the cotton touch, I want you to say now. Now if you'll close your eyes. Next, test now. for light touch using a wisp of now. cotton. After explaining now. the procedure, test in scattered areas. Now. now. Keep your eyes closed. Again, compare sides. Is this the same as this? Yes. To I'm test the corneal to reflex, ask the patient to look up and away from you. Now approach the patient from the side, out of his line of vision, and lightly touch the cornea with a fine wisp of cotton. Normally, the patient's eyes blink and tear, but a contact lens wearer may have diminished or absent corneal reflexes. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, innervates all the muscles of facial movement and expression. It also mediates taste sensation in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. To assess this nerve, inspect the patient's face at rest and during conversation. Note any asymmetry and look for tics or other involuntary movements. Next, ask the patient to raise his eyebrows, frown, close his eyes so tightly you can't open them, show his teeth, smile, and puff, out your cheeks. and puff out his cheeks. Normally, the patient can do these maneuvers easily and symmetrically. Cranial nerve 8, which is the acoustic nerve, mediates hearing and vestibular function. Because vestibular function is not routinely tested, our exam will focus on hearing. I'm going to, to assess hearing, occlude hearing. one of the patient's like ears with your finger, stand one to two feet away from the patient, and cover your mouth to prevent lip reading. Two, now four. test the open ear by softly whispering numbers or words. Gradually increase your voice volume until the Five, patient can identify nine. the spoken numbers or words. If hearing is diminished, test for lateralization by performing the Weber test. I'm going to, strike the to do this, fork. place the base of a vibrating tuning fork firmly on top of the patient's head. Then ask if he hears the sound on one or I both sides. The the Normally, the sound is heard midline or equally on both sides. Next, compare air and bone conduction by performing the RINA test. Place a lightly that. vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid bone behind the ear. When the patient indicates that the sound is no longer heard, quickly place the vibrating fork that. near the ear canal. Yes, can. Normally, the patient can hear the sound longer through air than through bone. Be sure to test the opposite ear. Cranial nerves 9 and 10, which are the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, mediate the sensory and motor functions of the palate, pharynx, and larynx. I'd like to take a look at the back of your throat. Can you open your mouth? To test really these nerves, ask the patient to say ah or yawn as you observe the soft palate and the uvula. The soft palate should rise promptly and symmetrically, and the uvula should remain midline. I'm going to ask Next, you to say, ah, test the again. gag reflex because one side at a time. Using a tongue blade, say, touch ah. one side of the pharynx, then the ah. other. You should see a prompt rise of the palate and other signs of gagging. Finally, ask the patient to swallow. It should be done without difficulty or regurgitation. Cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve, innervates the sternomastoid and upper trapezius muscles. I'm going to test the strength of your shoulders. To I'm assess this nerve, ask the patient to shrug his shoulders upward okay. against your hands. Your shoulders against During this maneuver, evaluate the strength and contraction of the trapezius muscles. 
Can you turn your head to the Then right? ask the patient to turn his head to each side against your hand. And relax. Observe the contraction of the opposite sternomastoid muscle and, turn your head and note the, the force of movement against your hand. Cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, mediates motor functions of the tongue, which in turn affect articulation of words. Inspect the patient's tongue as it lies on the floor of his mouth. Observe for fasciculations. There should be none. Ask the patient to stick at his tongue. Note any asymmetry, deviation, or atrophy. The tongue should protrude straight out. Begin the sensory examination by assessing pain sensation in the arms, legs, and trunk. To do this, use the sharp end of a safety pin or other suitable tool. Ask the patient to close his eyes. Then, starting with the arms, test scattered areas, occasionally substituting the blunt end for comparison between sharp and dull. I like you to say sharp or dull. Then, compare sides and distal and proximal areas. So, Complete yeah. the evaluation of pain sensation with the legs. Yes. Okay. I'm going to bring your gown. Next, test the anterior trunk. If you detect any abnormalities, evaluate the posterior trunk. Okay. Keep your eyes closed again. If pain uh, sensation is abnormal, test the patient's response to oh. temperature. Hot. I'd like you to keep your eyes closed, and I'm going to touch you again with the cotton. Say now when you feel it. Assess light now. touch with a cotton wisp. Now. Check the patient's trunk. The same as this. Yes. Is this the same as this? Yes. And say now again. Now. Arms. Now. And now. legs. Now. Now. Is Compare this sides. The same as this. Yes. Is this the same as this? Yes. Is this? And proximal and distal this. areas. Keep your eyes Next, closed. assess vibratory sensation using a lightly vibrating low pitch tuning fork. Place the vibrating fork firmly over the distal interphalangeal joint of a finger and ask the patient to tell you what he feels. Vibration. Ask the patient to tell you when the sensation stops, stops, then stop the vibration. Stop. Now test the other side. Normally, vibratory sensation is intact distally. If it is diminished, proceed to more proximal bony prominences, such as the wrist and elbow. Once again, tell me what you feel. Vibration. Tell me when it When stops. assessing vibratory sensation of the stop. lower extremity, Start with the big toes. Compare sides. Vibration. If vibratory sensation is diminished, check the ankle, patella, and iliac crest. Keep in mind that distal vibratory sensation may normally decrease with age. I'm going to move your toe For the next part of the exam, test position sense. To do this, hold the sides of the patient's big toe with your thumb and index finger. Avoid touching the other toes. Now, can you First, up move it down? up and down, identifying each position as the patient watches. Next, ask the patient to close his eyes and identify the direction of motion. Then, move the big toe up and down in an irregular sequence. Compare with the big toe on the other foot. In a similar fashion, Test position sense in the upper extremities using a finger on each yeah. hand. hand. To test stereognosis object or object hand. identification, to to place a familiar object in the patient's hand. Ask him to identify it. It's a key. Repeat the procedure on the other hand using a different it's object. It's another object. It's a button. To I'm test number identification or graphesthesia, Can you use a blunt object to draw a large number on the palm using a single continuous stroke. Seven. The number should face the patient, not the examiner. Test one palm, then the other. Nine. 
two-point discrimination is tested by asking the patient if he's been touched in one or two areas. Sure. Using two ends of an opened paper clip or the sides of two pins, one. repeatedly touch the patient's finger pad with the two points two. at the same time and with one point occasionally. Ask one. the patient to identify if he's being touched with one or two, two. points. Then reduce the distance between the points so that you can determine the minimum distance at which One. the patient can identify two points. On the finger pad, the distance two. should be less than five millimeters. To test Here. point localization, touch a point on the patient's skin. Here. Then ask him to open his eyes and point to the place Here. touched. This test is especially helpful on the trunk and Here. legs. Here. To test extinction, simultaneously stimulate corresponding areas on both sides of the body. Then ask the patient to point to where he was touched. Normally, he should feel the sensation in both areas. Here and here. In summary, the neurologic examination of the cranial nerves and sensory system includes general observations of neurologic status, Examination of the cranial nerves, including assessment of the motor and sensory portions of cranial nerves 1 through 12. And examination of the sensory system, including assessment of pain, temperature, light touch, and vibratory sensations, as well as position sense and discriminative sensations. This video presents examination of the head, including inspection of the head, hair, scalp, skull, and face. Examination of the eyes, including tests for visual acuity and visual fields, inspection of the eyes, and ophthalmoscopic examination. And examination of the ears, including inspection of the ears, otoscopic examination, and tests for hearing. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. Begin your examination with inspection of the head. Observe the size, shape, and position of the head, as well as its proportion to the neck and the rest of the body. Inspect the hair, noting its quantity, texture, distribution, and pattern of loss, if any. Part the hair in several areas to inspect the scalp. Have you noticed any problems? Observe for scaling, lumps, lesions, scars, and nits, or lice eggs which are tiny white ovoid granules that adhere to hairs. Palpate the scalp and skull for masses and tenderness. When examining the patient's face, observe it at rest and during conversation. Also, assess the color and condition of the skin on the face. Look for skin lesions, scars, masses, edema, and unusual pigmentation or facial hair. Begin the eye examination by assessing the patient's visual acuity. To do this, have the patient stand 20 feet from a Snellen eye chart. If the patient wears contact lenses or general purpose glasses, tell her to wear them. But ask the patient to remove reading glasses because they blur distance vision. F E. Note the visual acuity printed at the side of the line of the eye chart. Z and D. Now I'd like you to try to read the next line. D, um, F, F. Then repeat the test on the other eye. Remember D, to record C, visual acuity P, using two numbers, such as 2020, which is normal. E and F. Now, now prepare to test the patient's things. visual fields. Directly face the patient from a comfortable distance and imagine a glass bowl encircling the patient's head. Ask the patient to look into your eyes. As you return her gaze, Place your hands two feet apart lateral to the patient's ears. Then, at ear level, move your wiggling fingers along the imaginary bowl until the patient points to them. Repeat these movements in the upper and lower temporal quadrants. Normally, a patient sees both sets of fingers at the same time. If so, the visual fields are usually normal. Note that the eyebrows normally limit the visual fields in the upper temporal quadrants compared to the lower temporal quadrants and the directly lateral areas. During the eye inspection, observe the alignment and symmetry of the eyes. 
Also, examine the eyebrows and closely inspect the eyelids. Normally, the upper eyelid covers a portion of the iris, but does not overlap the pupil. Inspect the area over the lacrimal gland and lacrimal sac for swelling. To inspect the conjunctiva and sclera, ask the patient to look up as you depress the lower lids with your thumbs. Normally, the palpebral conjunctiva is pink and uncongested. The bulbar conjunctiva is transparent with vessels running through it, and the underlying sclera is white. With oblique lighting, inspect each cornea and lens for opacities. To do this, shine a pen light from the side toward the eye. You should see no opacities. Even with outside lighting, you may notice a corneal arcus in an older patient. This normal variation is a white ring around the periphery of the cornea. Carefully inspect each iris and pupil. Normally, iris markings are clearly defined, and the pupils are round and equal in size. Just look straight ahead and into the distance. Mm -hmm. Continue assessing the pupils by checking their reaction to light. Observing one eye at a time, ask the patient to look into the distance. Then, from the side, shine a bright light into one eye and observe its pupillary response. The pupil should constrict briskly in direct reaction to the light. Now shine the light into the same eye again, but observe the pupillary reaction of the opposite pupil. It should constrict briskly in a consensual response. Repeat the process with the other eye. Watch for direct and consensual pupillary reactions again. If the pupillary light reaction is abnormal or questionable, Test the near reaction. Hold your finger or a pencil about 10 centimeters from the patient's eyes and tell her what to do. Watch for pupillary dilation with distant gaze and pupillary constriction with near effort. Repeat this test if necessary and then repeat it in the other eye. To assess the extraocular muscles, shine a light onto the patient's eyes from about two feet away. Ask her to look at the light. From just behind your light, observe its reflections. These should be visible slightly nasal to the center of the pupils. Now check the six cardinal directions of gaze. These directions correspond to the coordinated action of six muscles involved in eye movement, innervated by cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. From 2 to 3 feet in front of the patient, ask the patient to follow your finger. Making a wide H in the air, lead the patient's gaze to the patient's far right, to the right and up, to the right and down, and without pausing in the middle, to the far left, to the left and up, and finally to the left and down. Eye movements should be symmetrical and conjugate. To detect nystagmus, pause during upward and lateral gaze. A few beats of nystagmus on extreme lateral gaze are normal. In a patient with lid lag, watch for a rim of sclera between the upper lid and iris as the eyes move up and down. To test for convergence, observe as the patient's eyes watch your finger move toward the bridge of the nose. Normally, the eyes converge and follow your finger to within 5 to 8 centimeters of the nose. When you're ready to examine the fundus, switch on the ophthalmoscope light and adjust it to the large round beam of white light. Also, make sure the light is bright enough. Set the ophthalmoscope to zero diopters. After darkening the room, ask the patient to look over your left shoulder at a specific spot on the wall. Using your left eye and left hand, examine the patient's left eye. From 15 inches away and 15 degrees lateral to the patient's line of vision, Shine the light beam on the pupil. Locate the red reflex, which should appear as an orange glow in the pupil. Note any opacities that interrupt the red reflex. While holding the red reflex in view, approach the patient's eye along a 15 degree line lateral to her line of vision until the ophthalmoscope is close to the eye. 
try to find the optic disc by following the retinal vessels toward the place where they converge. Now bring the optic disc into sharp focus by adjusting the ophthalmoscope lens. Note the color of the optic disc, the clarity of its margin, and the size of the physiologic cup. Normally, the disc is yellowish-orange to creamy pink and round or oval with well-demarcated margins. It may be surrounded by white or pigmented rings or crescents. The optic cup to disc ratio is usually less than one to two. Moving your head and instrument as a unit, inspect the retinal vessels and adjacent retina by following the vessels from the disc to the periphery in four directions. Note the relative size and color of the smaller, lighter arteries and the larger, darker veins. Look for changes such as nicking of the veins at arteriovenous crossings. There should be none. Examine the surrounding retina for hemorrhages or exudates, noting their size, shape, color, and distribution. Again, there should be none. Finally, Examine the fovea and surrounding macula by directing your light beam laterally or asking the patient to look directly into the light. The tiny bright reflection at the center of the fovea may help orient you. To focus on more anterior structures, such as opacities in the vitreous or lens, change the diopter on the ophthalmoscope to more positive numbers, such as plus 10 or plus 12. Repeat the ophthalmoscopic examination on the patient's right eye using your right hand and right eye. Begin the ear examination by inspecting the auricle for position, size, and symmetry. Also, inspect the opening of the ear canal for discharge, swelling, or redness. If the patient has complained of ear pain or if you see signs of inflammation, Check for tenderness by moving the auricle up and down and pressing firmly on the tragus. Pain on these maneuvers suggests inflammation of the ear canal. Also, press firmly on the mastoid bone behind the ear. Tenderness here suggests middle ear infection. Next, examine the ear canal and eardrum using an otoscope. To do this, select the largest speculum the patient's ear canal will accommodate. Position the patient's head so that you can see through the otoscope comfortably. Grasp the auricle firmly but gently, and in an adult, pull it up, back, and slightly out to straighten the ear canal. Then insert the speculum gently into the ear canal. Note any cerumen or ear wax that may impair your view. Also observe for any discharge, foreign bodies, redness, swelling, or scaling. There should be none. Slide the speculum slightly down and forward and maneuver it until you can see as much of the eardrum as possible, including the pars flaccida, if possible, and the margins of the pars tensa. Note the color and contour of the eardrum with its distinct cone of light. Normally, the drum is pearly gray. Also, note the position of the handle of the malleus and inspect the short process of the malleus. The handle of the malleus, with the umbo at its tip, crosses the drum obliquely from the cone of light upward toward the short process. Be sure to examine the other ear in the same manner. Mm-hmm. For the next part of the ear exam, evaluate the patient's hearing. Occlude one of the patient's ears with your finger. Test the open ear by softly whispering numbers or words with two equally accented syllables from one or two feet away. Test one ear at a time. If hearing loss is present, gradually increase your voice volume until the patient can identify the spoken numbers or words. If hearing is diminished, do the Weber test, which checks for lateralization of bone conduction, and the Rinna test, which compares air and bone conduction. For each test, use a relatively high-pitched tuning fork, such as one of 512 hertz. To do the Weber test, place a lightly vibrating tuning fork firmly on top of the patient's head. Ask where the patient hears the sound, normally in both ears or the midline. To do the Rinna test, place a lightly vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid bone behind the ear. When the patient indicates that the sound is no longer heard, 
quickly place the vibrating fork close to the ear canal. Normally, the patient can hear vibration longer through air than through bone. Repeat the test on the other ear. Tell me when it stops. In summary, examination of the head, eyes, and ears includes inspection of the head, hair, scalp, skull, and face, tests for visual acuity and visual fields, inspection of the eyes, ophthalmoscopic examination, inspection of the ears, otoscopic examination, and tests for hearing. This video focuses on examination of the patient's nose, including her external and internal nose and the paranasal sinuses, examination of the patient's mouth, including her lips, oral mucosa, gums, teeth, palate, pharynx, and tongue, and examination of the patient's neck, including her lymph nodes, trachea, and thyroid gland. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Other patients may have the same normal findings or may display normal variations or abnormal findings. Begin examining the nose. Inspect the anterior and inferior surfaces. Note asymmetry or deformity. I'd like you to sniff gently. Test the patency of each nostril by asking the patient to sniff gently. Tilt your head back. Then tilt the head back Press gently on the tip of the nose and shine a light into the vestibule. Look for deviation of the nasal septum or signs of inflammation. To inspect the inside of the nose, use an otoscope with the largest ear speculum available. Be sure to insert the speculum carefully, avoiding contact with the sensitive nasal septum. Note the color and condition of the nasal mucosa that covers the nasal septum and turbinates. Normally, the nasal mucosa is redder than the oral mucosa and displays no swelling, exudates, or bleeding. Inspect the nasal septum for perforation or deviation. Look for any abnormalities, such as polyps or ulcers. Repeat this procedure on the opposite side of the nose. Before examining the mouth, ask the patient to remove any lipstick or dentures. Then inspect the outer surfaces of the lips for symmetry, color, and moisture. Note any ulcers, cracking, scaling, or masses. With good lighting and the help of a tongue blade, inspect the oral mucosa for color, ulcers, white patches, and nodules. In light-skinned patients, the buccal mucosa is normally pink. In dark-skinned patients, it can range from darker pink to patchy brown. Observe the gums for signs of inflammation, such as redness or swelling. Also inspect the teeth, noting any abnormalities. Next, inspect the hard palate for color and form. Then inspect the soft palate and uvula for redness and swelling. As the patient says, ah, or yawns, note their movement. The soft palate should rise symmetrically, and the uvula should stay in the midline. If the patient's tongue obstructs your view, use a tongue blade to depress it as the patient says ah or yawns. Finally, inspect the anterior and posterior pillars, tonsils if present, and pharynx, looking for redness, swelling, exudates, or ulceration. There should be none. Open your mouth and stick your tongue out. Continue by inspecting the tongue. Note the symmetry and color of the tongue. Inspect its dorsal surface, which is normally roughened by papillae and is sometimes covered by a thin white coating. Inspect the undersurface and sides of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Look for white or reddened areas, nodules, or ulcers. If you need to palpate anything within the mouth, wear gloves. To begin your examination of the neck, inspect for symmetry, look for enlargement of the parotid or submandibular glands, and note any visible lymph nodes or scars. If you see any masses or swellings, palpate them for size, consistency, and tenderness. Next, palpate the lymph, the lymph nodes. Using the pads of your fingers, feel for the preauricular, posterior auricular, occipital, tonsillar, submandibular, submental, superficial cervical, 
and posterior cervical nodes, and the deep cervical chain, including the supraclavicular nodes. Note the node's size, shape, delimitation, mobility, consistency, and any tenderness. Normally, some small, non-tender nodes may be felt. Tender nodes suggest inflammation. Hard or fixed nodes suggest malignancy. Now, inspect and palpate the trachea for deviation. Next, inspect the thyroid. To do this, light the patient's neck tangentially from above. Now ask the patient to sip some water, extend her neck back slightly, and swallow. swallow. Observe for upward movement of the thyroid gland, noting its swallow. contour and symmetry. Identify the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the location of the thyroid gland. Now watch as the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and thyroid gland all rise with swallowing. Watch again. Normally, the thyroid and cricoid cartilages and the thyroid gland rise with swallowing and then return to their resting positions. Check your inspection by palpating the thyroid gland from in front of the patient. As the patient swallows, feel below the cricoid cartilage for the thyroid isthmus. Now move behind the patient and place the fingers of both hands on the patient's neck so that your index fingers are just below the cricoid cartilage. Again, ask the patient to take a sip of water and swallow it. Feel for the thyroid isthmus rising under your finger pads. Move your fingers laterally as needed for the anterior surfaces of the lateral lobes. To summarize, examination of the nose, mouth, and neck includes assessment of the external and internal nose and paranasal sinuses, inspection of the lips, oral mucosa, gums, teeth, palate, pharynx, and tongue, and examination of the lymph nodes, trachea, and thyroid gland. This video presents an examination of the musculoskeletal system, including inspection, palpation, and range of motion tests of the head and neck, hands, wrists, elbows, shoulders, and related structures, feet, ankles, knees and hips, and spine. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Keep in mind that other patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. The extent of the musculoskeletal examination depends on the patient's condition and symptoms. As you examine the patient, ask him to report any tenderness and be alert to facial signs of distress. Begin the exam by assessing the temporomandibular joint. Place the tip of your index finger in front of the tragus of each ear. And open and close your mouth. Then ask the patient to open his mouth. Good. Observe the movement of the jaw, feel for swelling, and note any tenderness or Very crepitus. Good. Next, inspect the neck, including the sternomastoid muscles, for symmetry, deformities, or abnormal posture. Now let's check your neck. Then palpate the spinous processes of the cervical spine. And the muscles of your shoulders. As well as the trapezius muscles. and the muscles between the scapulae. Identify any areas of tenderness. Now test now range of motion of the neck. I'll have you to test your flexion, to your chest. have the patient touch his chin to his chest. Your chin to your right shoulder. To check rotation, have him turn his chin toward his right shoulder, to your left shoulder and then his left shoulder. Now bend your head towards your right shoulder. For lateral bending, ask him to bend his head toward his right shoulder and toward your left shoulder and toward his left shoulder. And finally tilt your head back. For extension, ask him to tilt his head back. Note any limitations in range of motion.
Check range of motion in the patient's hands and wrists. Ask the patient to make a fist, extend and spread his fingers, flex his wrists, and extend them, and move his hands laterally and medially. Now let's look at your hands. Inspect the patient's hands and wrists, noting any swelling, redness, nodules, deformities, or muscular atrophy. Now let's check each finger. Now palpate the medial and lateral aspects of each interphalangeal joint between your thumb and index finger, noting any swelling, bogginess, bony enlargement, or tenderness. To detect joint fluid more easily, feel for it with one hand while using the other hand to compress the joint anteroposteriorly. To detect tenderness in the metacarpophalangeal joints, squeeze the patient's hand between your thumb and fingers. Then examine each metacarpophalangeal joint. Place your thumbs just distal to the knuckle on each side of the extensor tendon. Your fingers should be on the head of the metacarpal in the palm. Note any tenderness, swelling, or bogginess. Next, palpate each wrist joint with your thumbs on the dorsum of the wrist and your fingers beneath it. Now assess the range of motion of the patient's elbows. To test flexion and extension, have the patient bend his elbows as much as he can and then straighten them. To check supination and pronation, ask the patient to flex his elbows at 90 degrees and turn his palms up and then down. Let's check your left elbow now. Next, support the patient's forearm so that the elbow is flexed to about 70 degrees. Inspect and palpate the elbow, including the extensor surface of the ulna and the olecranon process. Note any nodules, swelling, or tenderness. Palpate the groove between the lateral epicondyle and the olecranon for tenderness, swelling, or thickening. Finally, press on the lateral and medial epicondyles for tenderness. Avoid pressing on the sensitive ulnar nerve. Okay. Let's check your right elbow. As you inspect and palpate the other elbow, compare findings. To evaluate the range of motion of the shoulders and related structures, assess flexion by asking the patient to raise both arms to a vertical position. Assess external rotation by having him place his hands behind his neck with his elbows out to the sides. Check internal rotation by having him place his hands behind the small of his back. If you suspect a problem, cup your hand over the patient's shoulders and feel for crepitus as the patient repeats the movements. Then inspect the anterior shoulders and shoulder girdles for symmetry, noting any atrophy, swelling, or deformity. Now let's check the joints of your Palpate shoulder. Palpate for tenderness at the sternoclavicular joint, okay. the acromioclavicular joint, the subacromial area. How, any tenderness in there? Mm -mm. No. And the long head of the biceps tendon. Now with the patient lying down, inspect the patient's feet and ankles. Note any deformities, nodules, swelling, corns, or calluses. With your thumbs, palpate the anterior surface of each ankle joint noting any bogginess, swelling, or tenderness. Feel along the Achilles tendon for nodules and tenderness. Test for tenderness of the metatarsophalangeal joints by compressing the forefoot between your thumb and fingers. Evaluate each of these joints by palpating the metatarsal head in the sole of the foot 
and compressing the joint between your thumb and finger. To assess the range of motion of the feet and ankles, dorsiflex and plantar flex the foot at the ankle. Next, stabilize the ankle with one hand and grasp the heel with the other. Then invert the foot at the subtalar joint and evert it. Now stabilize the heel and invert the forefoot at the transverse tarsal joint and evert the forefoot. Finally, flex the toes on the metatarsophalangeal joints. There should be no limitation of movement or pain. Now assess the range of motion on the opposite side. Inspect the patient's knees, noting their alignment and any deformities. Note atrophy of the quadriceps muscles or loss of the normal hollows around the patella. Then palpate the suprapatellar pouch on each side of the quadriceps, noting any thickening, swelling, or tenderness. Also palpate along each side of the patella. Identify any thickening, swelling, or increased warmth. Repeat on the other side. If you suspect a small amount of fluid in the knee, Look for a bulge sign. First, milk the medial aspect of the knee firmly upward with the ball of your hand to displace any fluid. Next, press or tap the knee just behind the lateral margin of the patella. Watch for a bulge of returning fluid into the hollow medial to the patella. None is seen here. In another patient, there is a positive bulge sign. If you suspect a larger amount of fluid in the knee, check for a balloon sign. To do so, rest the thumb and index finger of your right hand on each side of the patella. With your left hand, compress the suprapatellar pouch back against the femur. Feel for fluid entering the spaces under your right thumb and finger. If you feel it, a balloon sign is present. If fluid is felt, Press the patella backward against the femur with your right hand as your left hand feels for fluid returning to the suprapatellar pouch. A palpable return of fluid confirms a balloon sign. None is felt here. If the patient has a history of knee pain, compress the patella and move it against the underlying femur. Then push the patella distally and ask the patient to tighten the knee against the table. Pain and crepitus suggest a patellofemoral disorder. Now flex the patient's leg at the knee to about 90 degrees. With your thumbs, press into the tibiofemoral joint on each side of the patellar tendon. Feel along the tibial margins. Tenderness from a damaged meniscus may be present here. Then palpate along the course of the collateral ligaments, laterally and medially. Okay, good. Let's try the other leg now. Assess the patient's hips, beginning with hip mobility. Ask the patient to bend his knee to his chest, pulling it firmly against his abdomen. He should be able to flex his knee and hip without difficulty while the opposite thigh remains near the table. Very good. Let's check other movements at your Next, test hip rotation. Flex the leg to 90 degrees at the hip and knee. Then stabilize the thigh with one hand and grasp the ankle with the other. Now move the lower leg medially so that the femur rotates externally at the hip. Then move the lower leg laterally so that the femur rotates internally. Finally, abduct the extended leg until you feel the anterior superior iliac spine move in the opposite hip. Repeat these maneuvers on the opposite now side. Check on the other side. Okay. If a hip is painful or limited in motion, palpate for tenderness in three areas. 
First, palpate deeply below the inguinal ligament and lateral to the femoral pulse for the hip joint and the overlying iliopectineal bursa. Second, with the patient lying on his non-painful side, palpate the greater trochanter of the femur for the trochanteric bursa. And third, palpate the ischial tuberosity for the ischial bursa. Finally, have the patient stand and again inspect his feet and knees, noting any deformities. Okay, good. I'll have you turn around and we'll look at the back of your knees now. As the patient turns around, observe for any swelling in the popliteal spaces. Inspect the spinal profile, observing the normal cervical, thoracic, and lumbar curves. Also, inspect the spine for lateral curvatures. There should be none. Okay, Next, ask down, the patient to bend forward and touch his toes. A lateral curvature may become more up. evident with this movement. Then watch as the patient bends forward again. Good. The normally concave Good. lumbar curve should flatten out. Now sit behind the now patient and stabilize his pelvis spine. with your hands. To assess lateral bending, have and the patient right bend to down. the right. Good. And now your left. And left. As far as you can. Now bend back to check extension, you. ask him to bend back toward you. Fine. And to assess rotation, now twist your right have him shoulders. twist his shoulders to the right. And your left. And to the left. These movements should be symmetrical and done with ease. Okay, now if you'll rest both hands on the table, I'll feel along your spine. All right. And you let me know if you feel any tenderness. Sure. Finally, palpate the spinous processes for tenderness. And the paravertebral muscles for tenderness and spasm. How about in the muscles here? Do you feel any tenderness? No, it feels all right. In summary, examination of the musculoskeletal system includes inspection, palpation, and range of motion tests of the head and neck, hands, wrists, elbows, shoulders, and related structures, feet, ankles, knees, and hips, and spine. This video presents inspection and palpation of the penis and scrotum, assessment for hernias, and examination of the anus, rectum, and prostate gland. In the video, you'll see the examiner assess a healthy patient. In clinical practice, you may detect the same normal findings, or you may discover normal variations or abnormal findings. The male genitalia may be examined with the patient standing or supine. The standing position, shown first, is much better for detecting hernias or a varicocele. Wear gloves throughout. From a seated position, expose the standing patient's genitalia. To assess sexual maturity, if indicated, note the distribution of pubic hair, the size and shape of the penis and testes, and the color and texture of the scrotal skin. Later, you will palpate testicular size. Check the skin around the base of the penis for inflammation, excoriations, nits, or lice. After retracting the foreskin, if necessary, inspect the glands, noting any lesions or scars, and observe the location of the urethral meatus normally at the tip of the glands. Compress the glands gently between your thumb and index finger to open the urethral meatus. Inspect it for discharge. If any is present, culture it by methods used at your clinical site. Next, palpate the shaft of the penis, noting any induration or tenderness. There should be none. I'm going to examine your scrotum. Would you hold your penis out of the way? 
Sure. Observe the contours of the scrotum, noting any swellings or veins. Inspect the skin of the scrotum for rashes or nodules. None are seen here. With your thumb and first two fingers, gently palpate each testis to assess its size and consistency and to detect any nodules or masses. Testes are normally smooth, ovoid, symmetrical in size and consistency, and sensitive to pressure. Then palpate the left epididymis, noting any nodules or tenderness. Using your thumb and fingers, palpate the left spermatic cord, including the vas deferens, and feel it from the epididymis to the external inguinal ring. Note any nodules or swellings. Repeat palpation on the right epididymis and spermatic cord. If a nodule or swelling is palpable, further evaluation, including ultrasound, is indicated. To assess for hernias, inspect the areas of the external inguinal ring and the femoral canal for bulges and continue to watch as the patient bears down. Please bear down. If none is seen, palpate for an inguinal hernia. Using your right index finger for the patient's right side, invaginate some loose scrotal skin and follow the spermatic cord up to the external inguinal ring and, if possible, through it to the inguinal canal. Ask the patient to bear down or cough and feel for a bulging mass that touches your finger. Relax. Now palpate for a femoral hernia. Using the femoral pulse and inguinal ligament for orientation, place your fingers at the femoral canal and feel for swelling or tenderness as the patient again bears down or coughs. Please bear down. Relax. Repeat inspection and palpation on the left side using your left index finger to palpate the external inguinal ring. When a male patient cannot or should not stand up for this exam, perform it while he is lying down. This position also makes it easier to inspect all surfaces of the penis and scrotum. Cover the patient's legs and expose his genitalia. To assess sexual maturity, if indicated, inspect the patient's pubic hair and genitalia. Inspect the skin around the base of the penis for inflammation, excoriations, nits, or lice. After retracting the foreskin, if necessary, inspect the glands and note the location of the urethral meatus. Compress the glands to open the meatus. If discharge is present, culture it. Then palpate the shaft of the penis. Continue by inspecting the scrotum, including its contours and all skin surfaces. Then palpate each testis and epididymis. Feel each spermatic cord, including the vas deferens, and palpate it from the epididymis to the external inguinal ring. Inspect the right external inguinal ring and the femoral canal for hernias and ask the patient to bear down. Bear down. Although it is often impossible to palpate an inguinal hernia in a supine patient, you may try to do so by the usual method. Bear down. Relax. Next, 
feel for a femoral hernia as you did with the patient there standing. Then examine the other side. Relax. To examine the rectum, position the patient on his left side close right to the edge of the table. Desk. His right leg should be flexed at the hip and knee. Drape the patient appropriately and adjust the lighting for a good view of the anus and surrounding area. Spread the buttocks apart and inspect the sacrococcygeal and perianal areas for lesions, redness, rashes, or excoriations. Palpate any abnormal areas, noting any tenderness. Ask the patient to bear down as you inspect the anus for hemorrhoids, fissures, or other lesions. None are seen here. Now lubricate your index finger and tell the patient that you're going to put I'm a finger into his rectum. rectum. You may feel some pressure. Ask the patient finger. to bear down and place the pad of your index finger bear over down. the anus. As the sphincter relaxes, gently insert your fingertip into the anal canal, pointing toward the umbilicus. Ask the patient to relax. Note sphincter tone, tenderness, induration, irregularities, or nodules. To palpate as much of the rectal wall as possible, insert your finger fully and rotate your hand clockwise as far as possible. Then counterclockwise. Note any nodules, irregularities, or undue tenderness. By asking the patient to bear down, you can sometimes bring a suspected lesion into reach. With your hand still in a full counterclockwise position, slide your finger over the posterior surface of the prostate gland, noting its size, shape, and consistency. Identify the lateral lobes, median sulcus, and any hard areas, nodules, or tenderness. Return your hand to a neutral position and gently withdraw your finger. Your examination is complete. Wipe Would the anus to bed? remove any lubricant or give the patient tissues to do so himself. If fecal matter is present, test it for occult blood. There were no masses on your examination. When a patient is fully ambulatory, it may be easier to examine the anus, rectum, and prostate while he is standing. To do this, have the patient rest his upper body on the examining table. Spread the buttocks and inspect the sacrococcygeal and perianal areas. Would you please bear down? As the patient bears down, inspect the anus for hemorrhoids or other lesions. After lubricating your index finger, insert it fully and rotate it to feel as much of the rectal wall as possible on the patient's left and posteriorly. And on the right and anteriorly. Then through the anterior wall of the rectum, palpate the prostate gland, its two lateral lobes, and the median sulcus. Note any nodules, hard areas, or tenderness. Gently withdraw your finger and wipe the patient's anus or give him tissues to do so. If fecal matter is present on the glove, test it for occult Everything blood. Looks great. To summarize, examination of the male genitalia, anus, and rectum includes inspection and palpation of the penis and scrotum, assessment for hernias, and examination of the anus, rectum, and prostate gland. Before you start your examination, Make sure the equipment is within easy reach, including vaginal specula of various sizes, materials for Papanicolo smears, bacteriologic cultures or other diagnostic tests, examining gloves, water-soluble lubricant, a basin of warm water, cotton swabs, and tissues. The patient should have emptied her bladder before the exam. Now raise the head of the table or support her head with a pillow. To help her into a lithotomy position, ask her to place first one heel into the footrest, then the other. Instruct the patient to move toward the end of the table until her buttocks extend slightly beyond its edge. 
Her thighs should be flexed and abducted at the hips. Now arrange the drape so that it covers the patient's thighs and knees and depress it in the middle to allow eye contact between you and the patient. Adjust the light. Wear gloves throughout the examination. As you proceed, explain each step of the procedure, move at a relaxed pace, and check the patient's facial expression for anxiety or discomfort. While seated comfortably, inspect the patient's external genitalia, including the mons pubis, labia, and perineum. To assess sexual maturity, if indicated, note the distribution of pubic hair and correlate it with breast development. Also, inspect the pubic area for excoriations, inflammation, nits, or lice. Inspect the labia majora for swelling, bruises, or varicosities. You're going to feel me touch you now. Tell the patient that you will be touching her external genitalia. Separate the labia majora, if necessary, and inspect the labia minora, clitoris, urethromiatus, and vaginal opening. Note any inflammation, discharge, ulceration, swelling, or nodules. Palpate any lesions for consistency and tenderness. None are seen here. If you see swelling in the region of Bartolin's glands, or if there is a history of it, insert your index finger into the vaginal opening and place your thumb outside the labium magus in an 8 o'clock position. Palpate for swelling or tenderness. With your thumb at a four o'clock position, repeat on the other side. If you suspect urethritis or paraurethral gland inflammation, lubricate your index finger with warm water, insert it into the vagina, and milk the urethra gently from the inside outward. Culture any discharge by the method used at your practice site. To begin the internal examination, assess the support of the vaginal walls. After separating the labia, ask the patient to bear down. Note any abnormal bulging of the vaginal walls, indicating a cystocele or rectocele. None is seen here. Reglove if necessary. To determine the position of the cervix, lubricate your index finger with warm water and insert it gently into the vagina until it touches the firm, rounded cervical surface. This step will help you to direct the speculum to the cervix. Now select a speculum of appropriate size and lubricate it with warm water only. Do not use a gel lubricant because it interferes with cultures and distorts cells taken for pap smears. To enlarge the vaginal opening, Place one or two fingers at its lower margin and press down gently. Can you bear Ask down? the patient to bear down and tell her that you're going to insert the speculum. To avoid the sensitive anterior structures, hold the closed speculum at an oblique angle and slide it past your fingers on a downward slope along the posterior vaginal wall. Rotate the speculum to a horizontal position and withdraw your fingers. Then, recalling the position of the cervix, direct the speculum accordingly until the cervix comes into full view. If the cervix does not easily come into view, withdraw the speculum slightly and redirect it at a different angle. When you can see the cervix fully, lock the speculum and adjust the light as necessary. Inspect the cervix and os. Note the color, position, and surface characteristics of the cervix, as well as any abnormalities, such as bleeding, ulcerations, masses, cysts, or nodules. Note the shape of the os. Look for discharge. None is seen here. Normal cervical discharge varies from clear to white and thin to thick. It is usually odorless. 
If colored or malodorous, examine the discharge microscopically and culture it. Okay, Next, obtain specimens for a pap smear. To collect endocervical cells, insert a saline moistened cotton applicator into the cervical os. Rotate the tip of the cotton applicator 360 degrees. Then remove it and gently roll the sample on a glass slide and fix it by the method used at your clinical site. Next, obtain a specimen from the ectocervix, including the squamocolumnar junction. To do this, place the longer end of a spatula into the cervical os. Press and rotate 360 degrees. Gently smear the sample on a glass slide and fix it as before. Both of the methods just shown may be used in pregnant and non-pregnant women. Other cervical brushes are available for non-pregnant women, but they may cause local bleeding. As demonstrated on the examiner's hand, this one may be used to get an endocervical specimen, and this one may be used to obtain a combined specimen from the endocervix and ectocervix. To inspect the vagina, unlock the speculum and withdraw it slowly, keeping it open with your thumb while you observe the vaginal mucosa. Note its color and any discharge, odor, masses, or ulcerations. Close the speculum as it emerges from the introitus. In a patient who has had a total hysterectomy, the vagina ends in a blind sac. Examine the vaginal walls anyway. Now stand to perform a bimanual examination. Lubricate the index and middle fingers of your examining hand. Okay. I'm going to continue the internal exam now. You're going to feel me insert two fingers into your vagina. Okay. And insert them into the vagina exerting pressure posteriorly. Palpate the vaginal wall posteriorly. Laterally. And anteriorly, including the urethra and bladder region. Note any nodularity or tenderness. Palpate the cervix, noting its position, size, shape, consistency, regularity, mobility, and tenderness. The cervix is normally rounded and firm with a consistency similar to the cartilage at the tip of the nose. It should be non-tender and mobile. Feel the fornix around the cervix. Press down toward the intravaginal hand as it raises the uterus upward. Note the size, shape, consistency, and mobility of the uterus. Identify any masses or tenderness. In a non-pregnant woman, you may feel an antiverted uterus above the symphysis. It is normally firm and mobile. To palpate the right ovary, Place your abdominal hand on the right lower quadrant and your intravaginal hand in the right lateral fornix. Press your abdominal hand in and down to move the ovary within reach of the intravaginal hand. Palpate the right ovary or any adnexal mass between your hands. If possible, note its size, shape, consistency, mobility, and tenderness. Repeat the bimanual examination on the left side. Ovaries are palpable in women with active ovarian function. They may be somewhat tender normally. Palpation is often difficult okay, in obese or normal. poorly relaxed women. The rectovaginal examination enables you to feel behind the cervix and perhaps a little higher. As you ask the patient to bear down, Introduce your index finger into the vagina and your middle finger into the rectum. 
ask the patient to relax and re-examine the uterus, the right adnexa, and the left adnexa. Then palpate the region behind the cervix. If the uterus is retroverted or retroflexed as shown here, it may be palpable only by the rectal finger. Withdraw your fingers gently. Here to feel me touch you once again. After okay. changing your gloves, examine the anus and rectum. Inspect the perianal area for lesions, redness, rashes, or excoriation. Palpate abnormal areas, noting any tenderness. Can you bear down? Ask the patient to bear down and inspect the anal area for hemorrhoids or other lesions. None are seen here. Relubricate your index finger and tell the patient what you're going to do. You're going to feel me touch you. you Again, you ask the patient to bear down. Place the pad of your index finger over the anus. As the sphincter relaxes, gently insert your fingertip into the anal canal so that it points toward the umbilicus. Okay, relax your ask the patient to relax. Note the sphincter tone and any tenderness or nodules. To palpate as much of the rectal surface as possible, insert your finger fully and rotate your hand counterclockwise as far as you can. Then rotate it clockwise. Note any nodules, irregularities, or tenderness. Can you bear down? By asking the patient to bear down, you can sometimes bring a suspected lesion into reach. Normally, the cervix can be felt through the anterior rectal wall. Gently withdraw your finger. Wipe the vulva and anus to remove any lubricant or give the patient tissues to do so. If fecal matter is present on the glove, test it for occult blood. Finally, ask the patient to slide back on the examination table and sit up, assisting her if necessary. To summarize, examination of the female genitalia, anus, and rectum includes examination of the external genitalia, the internal genitalia, including bimanual and rectovaginal palpation, and the anus and rectum. This video presents inspection and palpation of the breasts, aureli, and nipples, and inspection and palpation of the axillae. In the video, you'll see the examiner assess a healthy patient. In clinical practice, you may detect the same normal findings, or you may discover normal variations or abnormal findings. To begin the examination, inspect the breasts with the patient seated and her arms at her sides. The size and shape of normal breasts vary widely as a result of heredity, age, nutrition, endocrine activity, parity, lactation, and pregnancy. Inspect the skin over the breasts, noting any abnormalities, such as redness or thickened skin with prominent pores. Also observe the breasts for symmetry of shape and size. Some difference in size is common and usually normal. Then inspect the contour of each breast carefully to detect any masses, dimpling, or flattening. Next, inspect the nipples and areli, noting their size and shape. Look for rashes, ulcerations, discharge, or any asymmetry of the directions in which the nipples point. Then use two arm movements that may bring out skin dimpling that suggests an underlying lesion such as cancer. First, ask the patient to raise her arms over her head. Okay, now lower your arms and press them against your hips. Next, ask her to press her hands against her hips. With each movement, inspect the breast contours carefully. When the patient's breasts are large or pendulous, a third position is useful. Ask the patient to stand and lean forward, supported by your hands or by a chair. Her breasts should hang free from the chest wall. Look for dimpling of the skin and retraction of the nipples. None are seen here. 
Next, with your fingers flat on the breast, compress it gently against the chest wall. With the pads of three fingers, palpate in a smooth rotary motion, assessing the breast tissue for consistency, tenderness, and nodules or masses. Use a systematic pattern, such as concentric circles, clock times, or parallel lines to palpate the entire breast. A pattern of parallel lines is demonstrated. Complete palpation of the breast by examining the tail. Although normal breasts may be diffusely lumpy, try to identify any nodule or mass that is larger or different from the rest of the breast tissue. Note its location, size, shape, consistency, and tenderness. Is it well circumscribed or not? When you try to move it, does it seem mobile? And does the nearby skin become dimpled, suggesting an underlying lesion such as cancer? Next, palpate the nipple, noting its elasticity. If the patient had reported spontaneous discharge from the nipple, compress the breast and areola with one finger that points to the nipple. Continue in a radial pattern around the nipple, trying to identify the source of the discharge. Shift the pillow to the opposite side and examine the other breast. This time the pattern of concentric circles is demonstrated. Although examination of the male breasts may be brief, it should not be omitted. Inspect the breasts for symmetry and size, and inspect each nipple and areola for nodules or ulcerations. Then palpate the areola for nodules. If the breast appears large, try to distinguish soft fat from the firm disc of glandular tissue. Repeat on the other side. With the patient's arm raised, inspect the left axilla, noting any rash, infection, or unusual pigmentation. After the patient lowers her arm, support her left wrist with your left hand and ask her to relax her arm. Now palpate the patient's left axilla by cupping the fingers of your right hand together and reaching as high as possible toward the apex of the axilla. As you bring your fingers down, try to feel the central nodes against the rib cage. Note their size, shape, consistency, mobility, and tenderness. If the central nodes feel abnormal, or if there are lesions in their drainage area, feel for the other groups of axillary nodes. For the pectoral nodes, Feel inside the anterior axillary fold with your fingers while your thumb stabilizes the tissue from in front. For the lateral nodes, feel high in the axilla along the upper humerus. For the subscapular nodes, step behind the patient and with your fingers deep inside the muscle of the posterior axillary fold, feel near the edge of the scapula. Again, your thumb provides stability. If you find any signs of malignancy or inflammation in the breasts, or if the axillary lymph nodes are enlarged or tender, examine the infraclavicular and supraclavicular nodes. You raise your right arm now. Thank you. Repeat the axillary examination on the right side, beginning with inspection. Then, supporting the patient's right wrist with your right hand, 
palpate with your left hand. Again, feel for enlargement of the central nodes and, if indicated, the other axillary nodes. In summary, examination of the breasts and axillae involves inspection and palpation of the breasts, aurelae, and nipples, and inspection and palpation of the axillae.